Hi, Becky. You're smiling. Everybody, that was Hello. my son who frantically went and said, oh, my goodness, help me. So, okay, good. It's one thirty. Is everybody here? I'm not seeing Councilmember Hobart. I do not see. Is Mr. Hobart here? Becky, do you know if he's here? I don't see him unless he's caller number one. I don't see him on the list. Okay, we'll wait a few minutes for Mr. Hobart. Oh, he just jumped on. Oh, I see him now. Okay. I think we're all here. It's 1.30, so I call the meeting to order. Audit and Finance, November 20, 2020. Becky, could you do a roll call for us? Of course. Council Members Perkins? Here. DeLucy? Here. Hobart? Dan, can you unmute your mic? I'm going to text him and ask him to unmute his mic. Um, I'll try to unmute it from my end too, just to see. Okay. Mm. Yeah, it's not letting me. I just sent him a text, so let's hope. <clears throat> I don't want to proceed. Oh, it, he's answered no mic right now. Okay, so I guess, um, Mr. Hobart, if you're going to work without a mic, you might want to call in. I've had to do that before I had the telephone for audio and the screen for visual. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start the meeting. Hobart says he is listening. He simply does not have a microphone right now. He's working on it. So additional attendees, Becky, if you could just make note of the additional attendees for our meeting. Can do. Uh, so right now on today's call, we have Adam Norris, Brian Kidney, Cindy Gray, Eric Erfer, Haley Rokowski, Christy France, Mark Tomaperi, Morris Heidi, Nancy Cooper, Nick Kinney, Peter Simonson, Sarah White, Soft Resources Team, Tamara Benson, Trish Oppo, and Zach Walker. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Per Perkins, because you have a mic, I'm going to ask you, have you had a chance to take a look at the minutes of October 23rd, 2020? I have, and also re-reviewing re them again. I don't see anything um, that needs to be changed unless the other committee members do. There is nothing on my end, and I'm getting a text from Mr. Hobart, and he seconds your motion, Mr. Perkins. So we have a motion by Perkins, a second by Hobart to accept the minutes. Okay, Mr. Luce, I have massacred your name four different ways from Sunday. Yeah. I so apologize. I'm very thankful that you're joining us with your report. Take it away. So, good afternoon, everybody. I'm not sure, did the report get distributed? Oh, yes. Okay, so I did not plan a presentation today. I'd open it up for questions, but I can, uh, if you want, I could summarize over a couple minutes what the findings were. Would that be helpful? I would go ahead and summarize, please. Yes. Sure. Sure. So, in summary, uh, we uh, we did an assessment of the current state of the implementation for your Tyler Munis product. Um, we we found that it's about seventy five percent complete, give or take. Um, the the current team has been doing a good job at chipping away at, at getting smaller issues done, but there's some larger things that we need to accomplish. Uh, I believe uh, I outlined, I think it's about a 10 step process and it's going to take about 12 months to get it completed. Um, there are a number of factors that help to get us to where we, to where we are today. And I probably don't need to elaborate on those unless you really want me to, we could, uh, you can see it in the report, but you had a bit of a perfect storm, right? And circumstances. So I believe that there's a, there's a, 
absolutely, if you stick to the plan, there is no reason you can't get this up and running and in much better shape and your implementation completed if we started in December by December of uh, 2021. Um, I think, what else What what else would you like me to go into? Um, Council Member DeLucci, yeah, do you have any, uh, I, any sections I, in particular? Of course, I've, I've read everything. Um, <laughs> and and I, I, I saw you said 12 months, but then I added up your timeline and it's 23 months. Yeah, that's a little bit, dis, uh, it's, it's deceptive. Some of those can be concurrent, so it's not linear. Some of them can happen at the same time. So I, I did. Are they dependent on each other? Pardon? Are they dependent on each other? Um, they they are somewhat dependent on each other, but like I said, some can begin while others are still going. Like for example, the um, the upgrade to the Munis version of 2019, we can do some things. Let me get to that page. I think it's if you, if you're wondering what we're looking at, it would be on page 15 of the report where you can see the different uh, steps that overlap. So, yeah, so it is, it, it should happen in that fashion. And some of the things that we want to get done, uh, we have to do first, like in talking to Tyler, we really do need to upgrade that to a newer version uh, before it's probably better to do that before we do anything else. Um, the timekeeping and payroll, because that's such a pain point that needs to be towards the beginning of the process. And that's also, uh, that's going to take four solid months. So that will be, and there's not a lot of overlap there. Uh, but human resources and finance, and then finance and integrations overlap quite a bit. I'm worried about finance waiting until July of 21. That 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 causes me concern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can do understand that. I'm to trying to. Pardon? Do we have to wait till July of 21? Uh, well, you don't have to, but I'm just trying to take into account all of the things that we're going to have to do like we're going to have to engage tyler that's going to have to happen first because we need their help for some of this we have to do the upgrade first um timekeeping and payroll i, I think with finance there's a, lo a lot of things uh the finance team has been taken care of uh, a lot of reporting has gotten significantly better i think finance is going to re revolve more around it that if i remember right the chart of accounts is a big deal we need to redesign that uh, that can happen outside of this process a little bit because that's more of a financial than a system uh, issue, but I'm not sure what, what in finance did you want to have happen more quickly? What was, what were you thinking? It, if I'm, and I'm, now I'm going back a couple of months, but within the independent auditors report that we received, I think in June or July, there mm -hmm. was a problem with um, manual transmission of numbers were having to be made because Munis was not implemented. And I'm concerned because every time you put in human error, you're going to have mm -hmm. a problem. And so I really was concerned that we were not making those automatic entries, that it was we were relying on manual entries. And mm -hmm. perhaps that's not a finance problem, but I, I remember that it was a finance problem. That's what I'm concerned about. So Brian, can you, oh, yeah, thank you. Yep. Yeah, let, let me address that. So uh, of the audit, issues that we had. Um, the, the primary one was uh, the bank reconciliation, if you remember, and that was completed. And we completed that um, within a month, I believe, of that report. So that was our primary thing. And we made sure that, so our bank reconciliation is being done uh, more automatic and timely. That was the biggest issue that we had out of the, out of the audit. The second issue um, was we wanted to make sure that we're able to turn over the audit, uh, our financial reports to the auditor using the Munis system, their CAFR builder. And we're happy to say that was accomplished on November 2nd. I think we, we talked about that last month. We had that really nice uh, commentary from, uh, from the auditor. The third one um, is exactly what, what you're talking about is that some of the uh, non Munis modules, um, aren't integrated directly in. And so what happens is that uh, this, the detail information resides on, uh, in this case, in the utility billing software. And the, it, and, um, it, it gets summarized. And then that summary is journal entried into 
the Muna software. Mm -hmm. um, what, uh, again, that's, uh, Ron, you might speak to that, how, how often people do that. It, mm -hmm. I've seen it 50, 50, half, okay. half the places I've worked, we did the, all that detail integrated into, into our financial system. The other half of my cities I worked for, they kept it at that summary level and then did the journal entries. So Ron, if you want to. Okay, Ron, before you speak, yeah. Becky, mm -hmm. I've just received a text from a citizen saying we're not online. It's not streaming. Can you um, contact Steve or whoever? Hey, Mr. Hobart, nice to see you. Oh boy. Okay, yeah, now, yeah. now I mean I can see the thumbnail right there on you. Are you talking to me? No. I received a text from a citizen that, that the meeting is not streaming. So I asked Becky to touch base with Steve to see if we can get online. Okay. Mr. Walker, I just don't know if we're not streaming, if we should proceed or not. I can't hear Zach. Can anybody hear Zach? No. Try it one more time, Zach. It looks like you're unmuted, but we couldn't hear you. Nope. <sighs> Somebody from City 7 was just speaking, I heard. I I might mention, I just pulled it up uh, online and we are streaming. Okay, thank goodness. Okay, Mr. Luce, it was, the, the meeting was turned over to you. If you yeah. had anything to ask, from Brian. <laughs> and, so, and, yeah, so. And, Ron, actually, I, I got a confirmation from one of my accounts. They just messaged me, and we actually uh, we download the the CIS transactions, and then we import those on into Munis. Apparently, so uh, it, it's I think what we're talking about is just the push it a button to automatically push it from the utility system straight into Munis. Okay, so we're not relying on on the manual entries. Well, it's a manual download and then a manual upload, if you will. It's just a, not, a, not an automatic, like, nightly push from one system to the other system. Okay. But, but that's in our phase. We, we are planning on that, Brian, in the integration phase and working with, a, with, with util, AUS for utility billing and the city works. That was one of the things on our plate. Right. Right. How much is the upgrade? Do we know? I, How much the cost is? There believe is that's no cost. There, it's Sorry, included, it's Council Member. Yeah. It's included in our costs already in the annual costs. Okay, okay. You mentioned a few times, I'm going to call you Ron if that's okay. Ron, you uh, mentioned yes. a few times <laughs> um, that we need adequate staff, and yet you dance around giving me a number. How many people do we need dedicated to the Munis implementation? Well, it's a great question. I think that is far, when I mean resources, so there's a number of things we have to do. There are different components. So there's going to be Munis or Tyler, because we're going to need to re-engage them, right, for professional services. We need their help. Um, there's going to be for those integrations, like we just were talking about with Advanced Utility, we're going to need them to help us with that integration and CityWorks. Um, we're going to need help with, uh, I think Brian and Cindy have already been working with a contract um, PM candidate. So we need to get that fleshed out, how much that's going to cost. So all these things combined, we haven't priced it out yet, um, but we need to start We need to start engaging on with these different folks for costs. I think as far as internal resources, I'm thinking that it's going to be, hopefully there won't be a lot of backfill required. It's going to be more, maybe a little bit of overtime here and there to make sure the people on the individual teams have the time to, 
to spend with us as we go through this implementation final phase. Did that answer your question, council member? Not no, sure. but you dance well, let me tell you. So we don't, we don't. It's not my intent. Not my intent. I really, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's a lot of internal, more like you need to add a lot of staff. I don't think that's it. It might be more overtime, right? And making sure the folks have time in their individual departments to dedicate when we need them in these phases for the plan. Well, it's just at some point in here, you talked about 50% uh, of their time has to be dedicated to this and 25% of their time needs to be dedicated to that. And so to me, I'm looking at page 11. So to okay. me, I was thinking, okay, so that means we need to add staff. I just don't know, for example, does finance need two people? Does uh, technology services need people? I have no idea. Let me help you. So, so council member, I think what, for the city municipal project manager, that person is the contract person that we were discussing. So basically that person is not gonna work for us full time, Brian, if I remember right, that was gonna be a more of a part time, which is perfect. That's exactly what we need. So that's part of it. Um, as far as, uh, as for the, that's true in the, I think for if the other person I think you're gonna need, there's two positions you'll eventually need. One is, gonna, is, a, is a reporting expert. And I would think you already have someone in your IT team who can handle this. But if not, they would need training in either this called SSRS, which is Microsoft reporting for their SQL backend or Crystal reporting. That is that that's correct, council member. You would need someone if it's not an existing staff member who can train up on it. You need someone who has that skill set. And then eventually, you're going to need when the uh, when the implementation is completed in 12 months, you need to consider taking that person who is uh, that part time PM. Who's, a con who's gonna be a contractor, you are. You probably are gonna need someone who's gonna be like a ERP or a munis manager. That is correct. So you're right, you would need a, I am recommending that. So that's 25 to 50% of a person you would need in a year. And so I noticed also on page 11, you talked about the city munis pro project manager. And my question yep. is, can the same person holding that position also hold 3C? the crystal reporting expert. Can one person do both those jobs or are they two independent jobs? Um, in theory, they could, but I'm thinking that the, the reporting expert might be a little more technical, right? Okay. Because, yeah, because of the crystal, knowing all the, the SQL statements and things like that, they may be too, too different. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Did you have Ron. something, Brian? Yeah. Um, Chair, I, I might also mention that two of those positions that Ron had just mentioned, the, the report writer person, we do have a person in tech service, uh, Billy Munshaw, that has that skill set. Um, that's, that's a matter of training and working with him on that. And then we do have a, um, a engineer position, a tech engineer position in our budget. Um, and uh, that was that was to be it's in the current year budget, but we've frozen that position, just awaiting to make sure that we're able to deploy that position in the right way um, and make sure we have the right person. So um, that that's, that's again, we'll want to fill that, I think, when we get a little bit further into the project, kind of a handoff, as Ron said, between the outsource project manager and then hand it off then to, to a tech engineer to handle some of these things. So that those are all in place and in the budget. And we're, it, we're just, we're not gonna, we're not gonna be looking for in, increases in budget to implement anything on the um, employee side, if you will, for the turnover. I, I think one of our problems in the two years it's taken us to just get this far is uh, we've lost staff and, and, um, and we haven't had enough staff to do what needed to be done. And so we're at this point where it's still gonna take an, another year. And I wanna make sure we don't run into that very same problem. So I guess, Mr. City Manager, I know there's a staff freeze on hiring. Do, does the council need to do anything to make sure that the $5 million that we've spent so far can actually be implemented within the year that Ron's talking about? Like, do we need to unfreeze these positions? Or is that an, a management? So, 
still can't hear you. Can't hear you, Zach. He'll text us. Councilwoman, if I can jump in there. Please. Along the same same lines, as we look through, and I don't know how this plays in, but as we look down the road, as um, our availability for our employees that are going to be ready to retire, that we have that institutional knowledge being transferred from whoever to whoever, so we don't find ourselves seven, 10, 12 years from now having to re redo some of this stuff. So I think we need to look into the future about how we get that institutional knowledge transferred. That's an excellent point. Yeah. Excellent point. And at this point, I don't know that we really need an answer from Mr. Walker. I think, mm -hmm. oh, we're gonna get an answer. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. I don't think that this needs any additional direction. I, I think the um, support you've given in bringing Ron in um, and allowing him to work alongside Brian, we've got subject matter expert now who can help if, if you'll pardon the analogy call plays in from the sideline and tell our staff what they need to be doing how we need to navigate these things where um, the resources need to come to bear so I think we've got um, the appropriate level of expertise on hand now to help that um, I think our staff have a better handle on that now now I'm not going to minimize it's going to require work and dedication of time but I think we've got the appropriate level of support now to pull this off were you able to hear Mr. Perkins when he talked about um, the institutional knowledge and perhaps doing uh, cross training? Right, yeah, that and, and that's a key consideration as well too because every time somebody moves along from the organization, we do lose that linkage and, and we do need to work as close to shortening that timeline as possible. And, and I know Brian has discussed that with me as well too, that every time, like I said, somebody retires, we're moving further and further away from the past. And the sooner we can be fully transitioned to this new system, then the less reliant we need to be on that institutional knowledge. Mr. Hobart, do you have any questions? No, I just, my only um, comment would be, or I guess it's sort of a question, but Mr. Luce and Kidney, are you guys, you feel good with this report, the timeline, working together, you're happy with the process the way it is now and the way it's progressing both of you yes I, I'm bright sorry Brian go ahead well I, I just want to echo what what Zach had said and, and appreciate the the support from this from this committee on on bringing Ron in it it is it has really uh focused us into success I, I think prior to this we were just just kind of going we needed some direction and this 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 report really is a good roadmap so i'm very happy with this yeah one thing i'd like to say council member really quickly is i think it's really important that we we need to go quickly but not too quickly right we want to make sure we give this the proper because part of how we got into the issue where we have today is that we went too fast or we tried to go too fast so i think this is the right pace i think if we stick on stay to target you got a great team. Everybody's really excited to get this off the ground and get it get it finished. Really, a, we had great response. Everyone was very positive when I talked to them, which is not always the case. So I think we're off to a good start. Well, I would just encourage both Mr. Luce and, and Mr. Kidney, if there becomes a problem that we simply don't have adequate staff, please don't sit there and suffer in silence. Zach Walker wants, I know as city manager, wants to make this a success. Okay. But we, we won't know to help you unless we know there's a problem, okay? And I don't know if we really want quarterly reports on this. I, I, I don't wanna not talk about it for a year though, guys. So. I, actually, I was just gonna ask you what, what you prefer. I mean, we could continue to do monthly, um, but we could also do quarterly. Um, We'll, we'll definitely keep you up to speed, keep you in touch. Um, I, I wouldn't mind. So uh, right after this, we're going to talk a little bit about investments. Um, my, my thought on that is we would we would just have a report for you each month, but it's not like we're going to have a presentation each month. So my my thought on this is each month we'll have just a a, a one pager, just a summary. Hey, here's where we are on the on the Munis project, and if if things kind of raise 
raise a red flag with one of one of the three of you, then then we can bring in and Ron to to talk through a little bit. That sounds great to me. Yeah, I think that sounds good. And and do the quarterly. Yeah, Madam Chair, I would suggest that from an accountability standpoint, at least having this as a monthly item on the agenda. I like Mr. Kidney's idea of making this a memo to the committee. And if we know that we need to get into something deeper, we could bring Ron or anybody else from the team in to, to go over specifics. But I think it gives you the comfort level to see that we're moving forward and is an internal tickler to us that um, we need to have something to show every 30 days. And I just, you know, I don't know where we are in terms of the firefighters payroll. I, I know that we're looking to see, are we gonna adopt the executive time or are we gonna do something different? But I know that there was a problem, I think with firefighter and police, if I'm not mistaken. Are, we're, I mean, we have to fix the payroll. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't know if, if we've already made uh, plans for the mistake that occurred a couple of months ago to make the city whole or what, what we're doing. So I guess, Mr. Walker, I'm asking you. I mean, I don't know that we're still having those problems on the payroll, but this to me says we're not gonna have executive time right away. So what are we doing on that? I, one of the things that we've done a better job of lately, I think is uh, the training side of things. So we've worked closely with uh, um, where the rubber meets the road, if you will, uh, the payroll entry specialists. So. Uh, I think those folks have a better handle on management of that system. Now, there's no sugarcoating that fire payroll is very complicated. I would say the most complicated time entry that we do in this organization, but um, there's been more hands-on approach of uh, the, the training side of things um, and, and providing that support. So I think that is helping cut down on uh, those errors. And in terms of the mistakes that were made a few months ago, have we made arrangements with firefighters to clean up the books as you were? I mean, some, some firefighters got overpaid. I mean, that's, that's the way it is. And so without this MUNA system, and I wanna make sure that doesn't happen again. And I wanna make sure the city gets its money back. Um, Brian, I'd have to defer to you on where we're at in terms of correcting that. Um, scenario sure um i'm i'm getting um some messages as we're speaking you know i'm going to ask cindy i hate to put you on the spot here you're, you're uh, so cindy gray is our uh, cfo she's the one actually doing the payroll right now um she's sending me messages and they're kind of coming in bitter mess cindy would you mind uh, just addressing this real quick yeah no problem so um Thank you. The fire pay codes and the police pay codes, they are working. Um, we, you know, right off the bat when we first went live, there were, a, we found some issues that did cause some to get overpaid. Um, we worked on those immediately. And as we came across those, they were fixed immediately. So the pay codes are now working. We are, we're very confident in what we have. Um, and as far as the one, um, we're working on going through every, for every firefighter's payroll from the beginning of the year and we're recalculating everything. So we're, that's a slow process because that takes quite a bit of time. We're in that process right now. And as soon as that's done, we will be offering the firefighters um, some options on repayment, which we'll probably have to go through the union on that to verify all of that. But yes, there, there is a plan and we're working on that steadily. Mr. Walker, I would like this committee to find out how big a problem that was and what the plan for repayment is when the management and the union have finally reached resolution, okay? Perfect, we'll um, try to have an update to you uh, um, very soon on that. Thank you. Anything else for, for Mr. Luce? Okay, moving forward, thank you, Ron, very much. Moving forward, new business update on various fund investment performances. I think that's you, Mr. Kidney. Yeah, that's me. I was just had to un unmute myself. Uh, I, I just wanted to bring the council or the committee up to speed on what we do with our investments. 
I think uh, this question has come up from time to time over the last couple months in presentations about interest income, how we handle our investments, um, how just how that all works. And it is it's it's a lot of money. Uh, at any given time, we're investing about 100 to 110 million dollars, and um, that's that's significant enough uh, to make sure that this this board is is aware of it. And so. Uh, decided just like I mentioned earlier about a one pager, we're, we're going to start including a one page uh, performance for you. Uh, so each month you'll kind of see where we are and it'll show uh, how much is invested, uh, what the interest rates uh, we're, we're receiving. We have a benchmark on there that compares that interest rate to where we think we should be. And um, uh, so we, we outsource a lot of our investments. We contracted with uh, Public Finance Management Investment Services. I'm not sure if that's the, the real, it's PFM. Um, we contracted with them, I think about a year before I came on board, maybe longer. Um, and uh, I, I just wanted to take this time to introduce you to this team that actually does the investments for us. And so there's three three folks that are on the line right now, uh, Nick Kenny and Trish. I think I saw Trish up up um, Her those two are on the line, and they are representatives uh, that work with PFM and work directly with me. They've also I see have brought in Bob Cheddar, and Bob is with PFM uh, Corp. He's in Philadelphia, and he's the one that actually uh, specifically directs investments. And so I, I think. Um, these guys are brilliant. I just want you to kind of get a little feedback or a little idea of what they do and what how they manage our investments. So with that, I'll turn it over. Nick, Trish, Bob, I don't know who's going to take this. Thanks, Brian. Can you hear me? This is Nick. Hi, yeah. Nick. Hey, everyone. I, I appreciate you having us on this call. Uh, like Brian said, we're, we're joined here with uh, Trish Apo and Bob Cheddar. Trish and I cover the state of Missouri uh, for PFM. Trish is in St. Louis. I'm in Columbia. Uh, I'm actually from Raytown originally, so I know I know Independence pretty well. Um, we've got a one pager out to Brian. I don't know if you guys see that or have that in front of you. We, we kind of had to had planned just to chat about that and talk about the current interest rate environment we're in, um, and certainly answer any questions you all might have. Uh, about the portfolio. Um, Brian, you want me to go ahead and jump into the, the little one pager here real quick or what works for you? Can't hear you, Brian. Nick, Nick if you allow me to share my screen, I could uh, pull that one page up so you got, so uh, people streaming could also see it. Thank you. That'd be perfect. Okay. Okay, I can see it now. Yeah. <clears throat> so, City of Independence has uh, quite a few accounts uh, that, that PFM manages. We're looking today uh, at the October numbers for the core operating fund and the short-term operating fund. Market values at the end of October, uh, core operating fund, $115,478,000. And the short-term operating fund at $19,963,637. Excuse me, Nick. Yes. What is the core operating fund and what is the short-term operating fund? Are they comprised of like the IPL, the water and sanitary sewer? I don't know what these, these words mean. Yeah, Brian, I don't know if you want to speak to that. I've got the list here. It's just all the different bond proceeds, uh, funds that we have. Sure. We can kind of sure, speak I, whatever detail you need. I, first. No, I, I, I can talk to that real quick. So at, at a certain point, um, the, the city, uh, the finance and, and PFM took a look at cash flows. We'll probably do that again here uh, soon. Probably annually we'll do this. And, and at any given time, we know how much money the city is the difference between money coming in and money going out it's just pure cash flow and so we know that short term wise we should have about 20 million dollars at any given time liquid and so that's that's um the difference between money coming in and money coming out 
uh, for the city for all funds. It doesn't matter what what fund it is. It all goes into this pool uh, for these investment purposes. And we've identified around $20 million as being those very liquid. We want ready to, to make payroll, pay our bills. Um, and this is also where the revenues for the sales taxes and things go to. This okay. core operating fund are, like he said, um, these are all of our reserves. Any any time where you know we're planning to make a big expenditure, but it's not needed right away in the next 60 to 90 days, it's in this larger core operating fund that um, that and this is that that fund that 115 million is what PFM then uses to invest. Was it was that helpful? Yep. Thank you. Perfect. So, so these uh, these funds reporting on the line underneath that these funds earn you interest and dividends uh, for the month of October. That was one hundred thirty four thousand thirty two dollars net earnings uh, <clears throat> on these two particular funds uh, so far calendar year two million five hundred two thousand one hundred fifteen dollars. Looking okay. at the Another looking question. at the lines below. Um, it talks about the performance of the funds. Uh, uh -huh. October down slightly. Uh, we were up slightly in September. I'll, I'll let Bob talk a little bit more about what those, uh, you know, what those numbers are, how they're reported as far as, you know, what you're invested in. Uh, but right now we're looking at a net of fee yield of 1.51% for the core operating fund. So that, that, that reports um, dividends, interest, and, and uh, market value adjustment on the fund. Bob, do you want to step in a little bit and just talk about the types of, th of things they're investing sure. in inside the, uh, sure. the portfolio? Absolutely. And ho hopefully everybody can, can hear me and, and, and good, good afternoon. Uh, so in, in, in the portfolio, we're required, of course, to ma manage the portfolio in line with the city's investment policy, which uh, demands that very high quality uh, securities. The portfolio is comprised of all fixed income securities and at the moment about 48% treasury securities and 52% federal agency securities. So that's debt issued by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac and home loan banking system primarily. And again, that's driven by uh, the, the, the city's in investment policy. Uh, but most of those holdings are in what we've called uh, the core operating fund. Uh, those uh, securities are invested with a maturity range roughly between one year and five years. There's a maximum maturity limit in your investment policy. Uh, so we position the portfolio accordingly to those uh, investment parameters. We do, as was mentioned, use a underlying benchmark to construct the portfolio and guide the overall strategy of, of the portfolio. That helps to ensure that we implement a consistent investment strategy over time, which is important to make sure that the city earns consistent interest earnings throughout a uh, business cycle. Uh, we went through both the interest earnings and the total return of the portfolio. Uh, the total return takes into account market value changes. So when interest rates move, the value of, of the underlying securities might move up and down. So that gives you a sense of how the market is is having an impact on, uh, on the portfolio. That represents unrealized changes in the market value. So unless we are to sell uh, securities in uh, the portfolio, those to secure uh, those uh, gains aren't aren't realized. Over the course of the past year, we show a couple uh, months here, but over the course of the past year uh, through the end of October, uh, the total return of the portfolio has been roughly uh, 4.69. Uh, 4.69%. So that accounts for both interest earnings and market value changes in uh, the portfolio. Uh, the, the most important uh, driver of the portfolio's performance over the past several months has been Federal Reserve uh, interest rate policy. Uh, in March, the Federal Reserve did lower the overnight rate to a range of zero to 25 basis points. So interest rates are, are very low. That was in response to the growing pandemic and the potential impact on uh, the, the, the economy. We, we expect, along with most of the market, uh, that the Federal Reserve will keep rates uh, within that range to at least 2,000 
and 23. Some don't expect rates to change until later, uh, as long as two, uh, 2025. Uh, that, that's because we, we do think the Federal Reserve will uh, try to ensure that the economy is back on track before they increase rates. And uh, because there's very little inflation at, at the moment, uh, the Federal Reserve's overnight policy at the moment is very much uh, tied to the level of inflation, which is currently running below uh, their, their long-term target of, of 2%. Uh, the, the current uh, yield uh, at cost on the portfolio is, uh, as, as was mentioned, was is, is a 151 net, net of fees at, at the end of October. Uh, one way to, I think, visualize this and the impact of uh, de declining rates over the course of the past few months, if we were to go to the market today, if the city were, were to say to us, you know, take these funds and invest in a portfolio similar, similar to what we have today, uh, the yield on that portfolio would, would be about 23 basis points. So that captures uh, the decline in, in rates over, over the course of the past nine months or, or so. Uh, another way to look at that is that the city has locked in uh, a very attractive yield over the course of the next several years because we, again, hold securities out to maturities of three and four and five years. So compared to the current marketplace, uh, the city has locked in a very attractive yield. Now, over time, that, that yield will uh, decline as securities in the portfolio mature. But based on, on where we are today, uh, I, I think the city's portfolio is in, in, in very good position uh, relative to, to current market levels because, again, we're, we're, we're very close to zero in many shorter-term maturities on, on treasuries and, and, and federal agencies. So I'll, I'll stop there. And certainly if there's any, any questions, I, I'd be happy to answer those. And I, I appreciate the time to speak to uh, the committee today. Thanks, Bob. How do you decide, or, or who decides, how much interest goes to the various different funds we've got? Like, how do I know the general fund is getting a return on its investment that it should versus sure. IPL fund or water fund or sanitary sewer? I, I can answer that. So part of the monthly um, closing that we do each month is we take the, um, the average daily balance of the fund, uh, for each of the funds that participate in this core operating fund. And then the, we take the interest earnings earned that month and allocate it back to them based on their share of, of that daily cash compared to the total cash. Uh, so it does get allocated. It like gets I'm allocated directly. And I have a, a five year certificate versus water whose certificate is going to mature next month. That the time of the certificate doesn't matter. It's the amount of money I have invested within the core fund itself that matters. It, that's exactly right. So okay. think of this core operating fund. This 115 million is this fund is the bank for the all the individual funds, and so each each of our funds own a share of this cop, co, uh, core operating fund, and when when the fund earns interest, they earn interest based on their share in this. Obviously, our IPL has uh, the largest, larger share because they have such large uh, cash balances, but every fund participates all the way down to any of our funds that may only have $100 in it. They still participate and they would get a fraction of that interest income. Is the same true of the short-term operating fund interest divi mm -hmm. division? Yeah, that's correct. And, and how, do, how did we come up with a benchmark of 0.12 percent. I'm just curious. I mean, is that an industry standard? Yeah, Bob, please go sure. ahead. That's a question. Sure. So, so, thank you. Uh, so we, we use uh, what, what's referred to as a, a, a Bank of America one to five year treasury index. So that re represents uh, the treasury market between one and, and five years, which is very similar to the city's investment policy. And, and several years ago, we, we had a conversation with the city about uh, what, what that portfolio would look like, how it would perform under certain interest rate uh, conditions, and it was decided that that structure, that portfolio structure, uh, suited the, uh, the city's needs. So it is a, is a, 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 a well-known, uh, often-used benchmark uh, uh, in, in the fixed income university. Again, it's a maturity range of one to five years. Uh, comprised of all treasury securities, which is, again, close to uh, the, the city's investment parameters. And final question from DeLucci. You mentioned 
was in the federal agency securities and 48% was in another, and I didn't catch the other. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, 48% uh, Treasury Securities, so United States right. Treasury Securities. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Perkins, Mr. Hobart, any questions? I don't have any. You asked the, the question how the enterprise funds that everybody got was redistributed back out, so that was my inquiry. Mr. Hobart? God bless him. We've lost him again. <laughs> okay. Um, are you going to be coming back with this, Mr. Kidney, every month, this investment report? Yeah, I, I was planning to, to make this part of our, our monthly packet of information that we, okay. we give to you. I, I think it's important, and I would be looking um, – at that benchmark versus our net of fees amount. Mm -hmm. And if, if you saw that we're not doing as well, then that would be where I would I would want a little bit more of a presentation from us on why that would happen. Okay, terrific. Mr. Walker, do you have any questions for management? Nope, I think um, we just wanna make sure this is something that doesn't get a lot of attention, but it's an important part of our revenue stream, maximizing those revenues. We want to make sure you guys were aware of that. I have been very impressed at the line items within our operating report each month. We are getting a nice return on the investments. So thank you very much, gentlemen. And Ms. Trish, we didn't hear from you, but thank you very much. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Work with compensation. Oh, somebody speaking? Okay. Thank you. Compensation, Mr. Kidney, and risk management. Yes, last meeting you you'd asked us um, to give a report on how we function, how, how our risk management functions, and so risk management is is basically uh, our insurance program or self insurance program. We have three broad areas. Uh, first of all, it's our employee health insurance, and of course that's handled through the, um, the stay well committee uh, for our employees insurance. But um, we, we also have our workers' compensation program, and that's um, handled within the finance administration department. And that of course protects our employees um, or helps uh, uh, make sure our employees are doing well if they're injured on the job. The, sec or the other portion is our, um, of risk management is our liability insurance. So if we're if, um, uh, charged against us for being negligent on some reason, um, how we handle those type of charges. And then also we have our uh, property and casualty insurance. So for instance, if, if um, uh, someone backs into a, a firehouse or something, how do we handle those type of the claims or if we, or if we uh, wreck a car? Um, so all of those together is what we consider our risk management program. And uh, prior, uh, about a year and a half ago, right after I came on board, uh, the way we were handling risk management was per a little bit disjointed. And that was probably because of the way that the department, if you remember finance administration was made up of multiple different departments. We had a, an accounting that included uh, uh, property and casualty insurance we had an HR department, and then we had a separate law department that handled some of risk management and then also workers' comp. So it was, it was pretty disjointed, if you will. Um, we decided uh, going into our 2019 budget process to consolidate those functions under one roof, under one risk management, and uh, we outsourced uh, a, a lot of the activity. So we used to have, um, a full-time risk management position. We had uh, one and a half full-time attorneys, and then we had another uh, full-time uh, assistant in the law department. Um, and then we also had a, another full-time workers' compensation employee. So all those together were uh, approximately about $400,000 in, in costs and expenses. Of, that's what it took to operate our risk management program. So when we outsourced, we contacted and we contracted with uh, Charlesworth 
Consulting, we pay them a fee of $120,000 a year to help administer it. Sarah White, I see, is on, on the call here. She's our in-house administrator, so she uh, facilitates Charlesworth work. And then um, Peter Simonson is our direct contact with Charlesworth, and they, are, they advise, if you will, all of our activity for risk management across workers' comp, um, property and casualty, and um, uh, liability. And then we also have Haley on the call here. And Haley, I think she'll probably talk a little bit. She's the direct um, contact with a lot of our employees in the workers' comp program. So I asked Charles Worth to put together a quick presentation. I know we've got a lot of presentations going on, but this is really, uh, I think, really important information. And you asked for it, so you're going to get it. Um, I'm wondering, uh, Peter, do you have your PowerPoint that you can share, or does it make sense, Becky, that I share it? I have it pulled up, but I, I don't have. I can't share. It says somebody needs to make me the presenter. If we could share it, I don't care who's who. I don't care who it is, whether it's <laughs> Brian or Peter. But yeah, I think it'd be helpful. Can you see that? Yeah. Yep. yep. All right. Um, Brian, do you want to start out, or do you want? Well, I think they've heard me talk enough. Please go ahead, Peter. Uh, well, thank you for having me today, uh, everyone. And uh, my name is Peter Simonson. I'm with Charlesworth Consulting. Uh, we've been working with the city since um, the beginning of 2019. And we've been working on the workers' compensation program since about May of 2019. Um, the core mission of the city's risk management program is to preserve and protect the city's assets, both uh, human and physical, and then to manage our exposure to risk. Uh, we cannot eliminate risk, obviously. There's a, a number of things that the city uses in their functions, uh, but what we try and do is manage that risk and manage the financial impacts of that risk in uh, the best way possible. As Brian said, this all falls under uh, the finance. Administration, um, Brian and Sarah. Um, once we... Oh dear. Peter, you're cutting in and out. Can anybody else hear? No? No, I I, I can't hear him. Um I I think Sarah, were you ready to give the presentation for him or or Haley? Um no. With your permission, I think I'll go ahead and, and take over the presentation just, just for time. Um, so uh, as as he's saying here, uh, we have a lot of partners on this. Charlesworth Consulting, obviously, our risk management consultants, they uh, essentially, they work directly then with Lockton, who are insurance brokers. We have Thomas McGee, who um, we've recently contracted with. They're the ones that um, when we receive a claim, either it's workers' comp or liability claim, they're the ones that go out and do the investigation to make sure, um, hey, this this seems, you know, if it's a car accident or something, they'll do the investigation and make sure to make a determination whether or not um, it's an accurate, whether or not we want to fight against the claim or, um, or oh, whether or not we sorry. want to settle, how much we'd settle. <laughs> and then- Am um, I there? Yep, go ahead. I, I've gotten through oh. Thomas McGee. If you want to take over for our nurse triage, because I think that's so, pretty Sorry important. about that. Um, Haley will talk about uh, nurse triage in a minute. And then outside counsel, uh, we use outside counsel to defend the city um, in, all of, uh, in all of the claims or on the lawsuits that we get against the city. And we maintain that stable of uh, attorneys. So with that, I'll turn it over to Haley. Haley is, Brian said, is our, we call our workers' compensation navigator. And she is really a, a resource for the injured employees to use and for them to, um, to uh, contact and help navigate their injury. Yep, hi everybody. Um, so like Peter said, I'm Haley Rakowski. I act as the city's workers' compensation navigator. Um, so my main role is to um, check in with injured employees and just make sure that 
um, you know, they're getting appropriate care and, and answer um, any questions and concerns that they may have. Um, so just going through this slide here, there's some key um, players in the workers' compensation program. Um, there's us, Charlesworth Consulting. Um, we help with um, getting the claims uh, to the third party administrator, Thomas McGee. We communicate with injured employees um, and departments and supervisors. Um, and then Thomas McGee, um, like Brian had mentioned, determines compensability and then directs medical care. Um, and then Jeannie Altoin is, um, they do, they provide the city with nurse triage. So that nurse hotline, um, that employee, injured employees call and nurse case management. So they've been huge in establishing um, an early intervention program to ensure that employees are getting, um, you know, receiving prompt care, um, which is, you know, huge in claim development and, and keeping claims um, manageable and, and just get, making sure that people, you know, get the attention that they need and deserve. So um, something new that we have also started doing is um, assisting the city with COVID-19 exposure monitoring. So um, to date, we have um, monitored 373 exposures and just since the end of July um, have helped coordinate testing for 109 first responders. So that's something um, we were really quick to kind of get on board with um, and just make sure that um, you know, city employees are, um, you know, really getting the attention that they need for COVID-19. Um, you know, when someone tests positive, um, like I said, we help coordinate that testing. Um, and then I'm checking in with them every two to three days just to make sure that they're feeling okay. Um, and I help coordinate that return to work date um, following city, the city's protocol for that. So. And we've um, not to interrupt, but we've uh, we've been really supported in that by uh, Chief Halsey and Chief Short. They've done a great job communicating with us to allow us to take care of our first responders, follow up with them, get them tested. And then also uh, Christina has really um, helped develop those internal protocols uh, to uh, city employees are um, being kept as safe as possible. Okay. And like Peter said, we took over the workers' compensation program in May of 2019. Um, and since then, we've made some big changes to improve the program. Um, so like mentioned earlier, um, we are now using outside counsel to resolve claims quicker. Um, my role was added um, to really just be a resource for the employee um, and making the, you know, this whole process as um, easy as possible. There's a lot of moving parts and it so just um, being there to hear them and um, really just act as an advocate for them um, has, has greatly made a difference. Um, and so coming, you know, that involves checking in with them and um, working with Thomas McGee and the nurse case management to just make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, so like I said, there's a lot of moving parts and it can be a lot. Um, and then I also um, work with the city and departments to, um, you know, send out work statuses, um, appointment updates, um, and then we get, you know, feedback to improve the program, um, which has been really helpful. Um, and then something we also do is we pay close attention to any patterns that we might see um, in injuries so that we can proactively um, address any safety issues um, to, you know, hopefully lessen um, those injuries happening. Brian, do Brian, you want to talk wanna... about the budget? You know, I, I, uh, I asked them to show this slide just to give you an idea of the scope. Um, if you want, I could have, uh, Peter go through each of these line items of what they are. Um, th this, this one is specifically a work comp. So, we, we do have a separate fund for workers' comp um, expenditures. So all these expenditures take place in this fund that you see lined up there. And then at the end of the year, uh, we have Charlesworth do an actuary study to see which departments incurred 
or has also has the risk for the workers comp and then we charge those departments back just again very similar to to how we would how you'd expect an insurance company to to operate so if if uh, the employees are in are in a riskier um code you know if they if they're doing riskier things you can imagine those type of employees versus say uh city hall employees and so there's a risk factor that go, goes with each employee and it, you it's basically based on their salary and we charge back to the departments um for the for these costs um one thing i think really um important to point out there is the um, you have two line items that that stick out pretty pretty far. The go forward loss is at two point seven million dollars, and legacy claims of eight hundred twenty thousand. So, Peter, you want to talk real quick about those two? Sure. What we try and do is we try and come up with a projected budget for each year for how much the total work, workers' compensation claims are going to cost the city um, for any injury that occurred in this year. So, in twenty twenty the budget is $2.7 million. Now, those costs wouldn't actually be paid um, until they were treated. There's a pretty long tail on workers' compensation claims. So those might not actually be paid for 24, even 36 months. Um, and so that's money that we try and set aside and budget to have allocated in the, in the risk management, um, in, the, in the workers' compensation fund. Uh, and one thing that we've done really aggressively in the last 18 months is try and close out old claims that were open that had just been so there were issues in them. And so what we've really tried to do is close those claims out, get those employees paid, move those off the books. And so some of the money that we've been spending is for claims that, you know, occurred in prior years. So it's, um, I don't know what the financial term is, Brian, but it's, it's a difference between the cash out the door for the claims versus the budget of the claims that we expect to incur um, in the future for this year. So if I can jump in real fast with John Perkins. So do we have any outstanding claims? I don't know, I'm throwing out never five years or longer that we haven't reconciled yet. Are we pretty current on as much as we can be? Uh, we do have some older claims. Uh, some of them are medical care only, um, meaning that we've paid the employee for the injury, but we're still treating them under under the program, which is not uncommon for us to do. What we try and do now is to pay and totally close the claim uh, when we're settling them. Um, but we do have some older claims that are still out there. Uh, sometimes it is um, an issue with the, they are still going through treatment. You know, if they have a major injury, they could be in treatment for multiple years. Um, and then some, it is uh, they're in litigation and those kind of uh, can drag their feet. But we are making it to uh, close out as many claims as possible and reduce the time that claims are open. And right now we have, um, Haley, I think has the numbers, but we've gone from about, do you have the numbers, Haley? Uh, we've gone from approximately 140 open claims to about out a significant number of claims. You're never gonna get that number down below about 75 that at any one time for an entity of, of the city size, we should have about 75 to 80 open claims. I apologize, I didn't realize my mic was muted. <laughs> That's fine, did I get those close? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, before we there... move forward, before you move forward, I'm looking at the operating uh, financial report from October on page 23. And it shows the fund balance for workers' comp is a negative 8.6 million. And I, I don't understand how this screen fits into that report. So, I might make sure. Um, so what, what you're looking at is on, on the screen right now, you're seeing a one, a one year snapshot of here's, here's what we think the costs are for this current year. Um, and you probably see this amount in the budget line item for the expenditures for $4.5 million. 
that fund balance includes um, reserves for, as um, as Peter said earlier, the legacy claims. There's there's large reserves out for those 75 to 80 um, claims that still haven't been settled, and those that's what that negative fund balance is. Are those large reserves that we know are out there? Um, however, we don't anticipate them all happening in one fiscal year. What you see here is what we what we plan to see come through the budget in 2020. But we still want to be able to show you that we have a large amount of of liability out there still for these these large claims. So are the reserves listed on page 23 or on another page in our operating budget? They're they're on uh they're not specifically called out on page 23. They are reflected basically they're reflected as that negative uh, fund balance. However, we can um, we can add a line item to that to kind of just show us uh, kind of call that out specifically what that negative amount is, which is um, estimates for future claims. So we'll, we'll we can put that line item there to identify that a little bit better. Well, it's just I understand this 4.5 that you're talking about here, but but translating it into real numbers, not just a screenshot. I just I don't see how how are we in such bad shape? I mean, am I wrong in thinking that's a negative eight point six million? That's how I'm reading it. Well, what what that means is we don't have we don't we haven't funded our reserves, so we haven't set aside cash to pay future future claims, and that's what that negative eight million dollars is: are future claims that we know that are going to come in, and we why just haven't I don't cash funded it. Why we didn't fund it? It's it's a truly a budget issue. So where's uh, this paper that tells Council. me what those future claims are and and um and how much should come from IPL and how much should come from police and how much should come from water? Where's that report? Uh, we we could show you the the revenue that we use uh, the breakdown. Um, but uh, it, you know, again, it, it's 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 an amount that, um, yeah, I get, I'm a little bit. <laughs> so yeah, the fund the fund itself, we know that we we owe another eight million dollars in past workers' comp claims. We pay them when the claims are made, and so um, we don't anticipate that full eight million dollars to come in and now, and so we don't we haven't funded, we haven't literally taking cash and set it aside to sit there waiting for those claims to to occur and then and then apply the money um we would love to start a program where we're building up the cash balances in the work comp program um but obviously as you can see these are large amounts and it's going to take several years to build build up that kind of cash balance council member delucci okay. yes please it's, it's Zach. Could I get just um, real quick a couple things here? One, I want to make sure that we understand that at any given moment, the, the claims that we have in are, are far going to exceed what we have on hand um, because every, unfortunately, uh, not literally every day, but, you know, most days somebody's getting injured, okay? Somebody gets poison IV or cuts themselves at the shop or wrenches their back or whatever. And so we have this large balance. But then we also have, you know, when the time the bill finally comes due and the amount we owe. I will say, um, over the years, this built into a substantially larger negative amount. Um, and when I first became city manager, the city attorney who, where this program was housed at that time, you know, every year we come in and say, well, if you want to fully catch this up and fully fund it, well, we're going to need seven, eight, nine, ten million dollars to to make it whole. We've gradually been trying to eat away at that, and as Mr. Kidney has said, try to get that closer to, to cash flow. But that's the work that Charles Worth has uh, been brought in to help us with, is to help us manage this more effectively, both in terms of the timeliness in which we get it paid, the amount on hand to pay these, and preventative, trying to keep uh, fewer of our employees from getting hurt on the job and incurring these costs. 
So it does not paint the rosiest of pictures, but it's up to two things. One, we're improving the picture every year by not putting more clones in the hopper and by um, um, the amount that we're able to fund in this. Um, and we're starting to eat down at that negative balance that had incurred over, quite frankly, several decades. So as I understand it, there's not money within the workers' comp fund itself to pay a past claim. And so if there's not the money there, where does the money come from? Does it come from the different, whatever department that worker was employed by? So right. I think, yes. go ahead, please. Oh, sorry. So I was just going to say what, what happens is, you know, for example, this year, we've taken the $2.7 million of costs for this year and charge the departments for that money. In a perfect world, we would hold that money until the 2020 claim comes in. But what we're doing is using that money to pay old claims as they as they um, as they get settled and we need to, and we need to resolve them. So that's where the actual cash flow comes from. It's from this year's budget that is going then to pay um, older claims. In addition, though, one thing that we have done in this budget, if you look that legacy claim line item of the 820,000, yeah. that is the line item to catch us up. That would be the contribution this year to catch us up um, and start whittling away at the um, what we think we're going to have to pay on those old claims. So 820,000 is in fact going into some savings account somewhere to try and whittle down that $8 million negative number? Is that what you're saying to me? It, uh, for, for most, uh, yes, yes and no. Um, hopefully if we don't use that money, then it, that 820,000 does go into, it, it stays within the fund and we'll, and we'll take that fund negative fund balance uh, positive or working towards getting positive um but yeah uh, the other the other thing is we anticipate this year and next year and last year probably is the higher amount of of claim expenses because we're we are paying off a lot of claims so our plan is to keep our rates the same that we're charging to the departments and so you'll hopefully in the next couple of years you'll see some surpluses in the each each of the annual budgets then that will chip away at that negative amount so we're, we're we've established this fund in order to um, get it to the point where it it is positive can we not okay and this is how ignorant i am uh 3.5 million in charges for services where'd that number come from because if we made that number different I mean, who are we charging? The different departments? Um, is that the next slide? The 3.5? No, I'm, I'm still looking, I'm still stuck on negative 8.6 million. Oh, are you, oh, okay. So that 3.5, um, that that equates to what you're seeing. Uh, this is the detail line item to, to that financial report you're seeing. So when you say that 3.5, um, it's made up of these line items you're seeing on the screen right now. So, the, these are all expenses that are that that it takes to operate this program anywhere from you know the excess serv excess insurance um, to the second injury fund payments we need to make to the um, state of Missouri um, you know again the say the the losses that we that we do pay off okay um, these are expenses I'm talking about the revenue on the original budget it oh. was three point five five eight charges for services and I assume, we're charging the various departments, right? Correct, correct. Okay, and from that, our operating expenses, the 4.5 million here you show, why are we not charging more for the services in order to get more revenue in to whittle down that de deficit? That is a, that's an excellent question. That, uh, that was a request, however, we weren't able to balance the budget in the departments with that higher rate. And so the actual amount charged to the departments had to be lowered enabled in order to make 
the balance the budget's balance this last year. Got it. Thank you. No, great question. Thank you. Peter, I any other questions? I so apologize. Couldn't continue. I'm sorry. No, that's a great great, great question. question. Yeah. yeah, those are really good questions. Um, okay, so um, moving on to the property program. Um, uh, the property insurance, that's what we use to insure all of our stuff. If there's a loss, we turn it into the insurance company and they will um, pay the loss. Um, the property insurance um, market has hardened. It's much more difficult. Uh, to procure property insurance and it has gotten much more expensive. It doesn't have anything to do with the city. It's the fact that, you know, there's hail in the Midwest and uh, hurricanes in the South uh, East and fires in the West. Uh, but, but we have worked with Lockton and we have um, procured insurance uh, for the city. Cost is at $1.1 million. Now this is a insurance premium. So we just pay that over um, and that uh, we pay it uh, in, uh, I think, August, and that's the insurance premium. And then any losses that we have, we turn those in. So it's a pretty straightforward. It works very similar to your homeowner's insurance. It's just uh, there's more on the hook for the city. Um, uh, I think our deductible is $25,000 and for most of our, our risks. Uh, and then for the utilities, it's a little higher. Uh, for Blue Valley, uh, obviously, it's higher. I think it's 100 or uh, 100 and $50,000 deductible. We did have a lot of changes this year in this program because we stopped generating power at Blue Valley. So that reduced our cost significantly because we now just ensure uh, that building uh, basically for um, debris removal and, and hallway costs. We're not having to insure it at a replacement value, which was uh, significantly uh, more expensive. The last part of the program is the liability program. This is the insurance that the city has for when uh, people uh, sue or file claims against us. Um, we used to be a part of MOPERM, which was a state uh, uh, risk pool. We are now part of a risk retention group called states. Uh, they, it's a little different uh, with a state's risk retention group. We are self-insured up to the first uh, $200,000. So anything under 200 grand, the city handles internally. Anything above that, uh, we have insurance up to $11 million um, of coverage for. Uh, this pro, I'm sorry, it's 10 million. Um, this program uh, allows the city to have a lot more control over how the claims are administered. So we pick the attorneys who represent the city. We um, have an adjusters that we used for uh, Thomas McGee and, uh, and it gives us a lot more control over how the claims um, are handled and how they're resolved. Um, the liability program is the budget is, it has some of the same issues in it that the um, workers' compensation program has um, in the sense that there are claims that are open that have reserves on them that we know we're gonna have to pay for eventually. Um, and what we have done is built what we're starting to do is similarly project what the losses are going to be and then budget for those. And then we've also been charging the, um, the, uh, the departments for the legacy claims that we have incurred, but have not yet um, actually paid out. And so that's where you see this Moperm legacy claim funding at uh, $128,000. That is um, budgeting for claims that we've already occurred. We just haven't paid out the losses yet. And then the state's risk retention line, the 710, that's what we would project to pay for lawsuits and claims that occur in 2020. So, so Peter, um, would you mind, would you mind just making a comment um, uh, on subrogation? Yes, that's the last part. I wanted to save oh, the best sorry. for last. Uh, <laughs> So the last thing that we do uh, um, for the city is subrogation, and that's where other people damage the city stuff. And it's taxpayer cost taxpayer money to go out and put up a, uh, a new telephone pole that's been hit by a drunk driver um, or to, to go out and repair um, a police car that got rear-ended. And so 
what we do is we try and get those claims from the city and then we pursue them on behalf of the city. And so far this year, we have, hang on here. Let me look, sorry. Um, gonna stop sharing my screen. Uh, we have collected $272,000 um, for the city uh, for people damaging uh, city property. And so that's something that we try and do. Um, you know, a lot of it's just uh, getting on the phone with their insurance company and getting them to uh, pay the claim. But sometimes we will work with the municipal court staff to if there's a claim where the individual didn't have insurance um, to make sure that that's part of the municipal court case um, for them if they're at fault. And Brian, um, I'm interrupting poor Peter again, but is that 270 some odd thousand that we recovered, is that reflected in the risk management page on our operating monthly report, page 24, or is that income divvied up already into the various departments? And so that's oh, where. Yeah, I, I can add, Sarah, if you'd like to address this or um, it, it depends, but I'll handle yeah. that. So it just really depends, um, Council Member Dosey, um, on older claims, if the department went ahead and went out and fixed the issue and we see that they funded that replacement of that equipment we just when we get that money from the insurance company we just submit it to that uh, fund that fixed the issue um, currently we are with the more current claims asking that the risk management fund go ahead and fund the replacement and then once we receive the insurance funds we'll just put that right back into the risk management fund so that would be reflected on page 24 in future months yes okay and I, I'm sorry, my brain is getting overloaded. So are, do we now have a general policy that we're gonna put everything into risk management? Is that what you said? Or are we still gonna make a judgment call if a department has already paid it, it goes directly back to him? It's yeah. one of those things where we want the department to consult with risk management, but some departments go on their own and do it. But for instance, we had one a week or so ago for fire, um, a siren tower or a siren pole was hit. They consulted risk management. I told them, let us go ahead and pay for the funding. So when we get the insurance money, we know it just automatically goes into the risk management fund. And that's something we're going to communicate to all the departments come budget year this year. And I just suggest, thank you so much, Sarah. I just yeah. suggest, Brian, even if a department funds the cost directly, I think the money should still come back to risk management for accounting purposes and reflect it on page 24, and then you can expense it out to the department. I think that makes a clear tra trail of where the money went out and when it went in. Yeah. Unless I, there's some I, other document we're not seeing. Right, I, I, I appreciate that. I think, uh, I think in the most cases it will work out that way. So, I, um, and, uh, I, I will say um, we do, so, so the way these funds work is like I mentioned, we, we kind of treat these funds as an insurance company and then the departments are the customers to the insurance. So each department actually does have a copay, if you will. So a department, if a department has a claim against it, they pay the first $5,000. And then this- Yeah, sorry, I forgot it. to mention that on the liability claims. So yeah, so, the, so, the department will be responsible for the first five on any liability claim. Yeah, so so sometimes that that money might go back to them because they paid for it out of those five thousand dollars. So okay. I, we'll we'll try to make sure we keep it as clean and clear as pro possible. But it it is it is one of those things that it takes Sarah working directly with the departments, make sure that that we're coordinating um, the the claims and and just making sure that the uh, the department is made whole with uh, through the insurance program. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? I have a small one. What's the uh, the safety committee budget? What does that include?
Peter? I didn't hear that. Uh, the safety committee, oh. their budget is $20,000. What does that include? I, I don't remember uh, specifically all that went into the safety committee uh, budget. I think there's training that we were never ever, actually because of COVID, we weren't able to actually incur or actually do. Um, but I think that there's other programs where you bring outside people in um, to do training and to assist, or it could be something with, um, you know, driver education costs or something for, for departments that might be having trouble with uh, defensive driving kind of skills. So, so it's that kind of stuff, um, more of a preventative type thing. And, and this, uh, that's uh, identified very specifically to be uh, worked through with a new um, safety committee. So the safety committee, I think, is kind of restarted. I, I'm, I'm not really sure where yeah, we are sorry, with that process. Sorry that my audio cut out there again. Um, yeah, we are working on uh, revamping the safety committee. We were having, um, I think, monthly meetings before uh, the pandemic hit. And uh, we've, we've had some um, turnover on the committee, but that's we, we try and get together and um, and have stakeholders from all over the city uh, participate in that. And we look at not only our property losses, but also our workers' compensation injuries to figure out where we can be proactive on reducing um, injuries and the risk of, of losses. Anything else? Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Thank, thank you. you, Sarah. I'm going to suggest that we go to the proposed amended tourism budget and we make that the last item. We it is almost three o'clock right now, and again we've run over. But I know tourism has a big. This has to be presented today, so I suggest we do that. Is that okay with everybody? Sounds good Absolutely. to me. Okay, tourism. Here we go. Who's in charge? Hi, Eric Harper. Good afternoon, Karen. Councilmember DeLucy, Councilmember oh, Perkins. Hi, oh, sorry. How are you? I've <laughs> been sitting here for a little bit. I need to wake up. All right. So um, we've got a little PowerPoint here to go through. We wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the plans that we put in place for compensating for the uh, drop in tourism transient guest tax revenues that we've been experiencing through this first quarter of the fiscal year. So I'm joined by Morris Heidi, assistant director is with us here today, Christy Franz, the tourism manager, and uh, Tamar Benison will be running the PowerPoint for us. Okay, so as you know, uh, the pandemic has hit the tourism industry harder than most industries nationwide. Now, we took a, a quick look at the, at the trend from March through the end of last fiscal year. And from that time, so March through the end of June, the transient guest tax was trending 57% down. So as you can see on this slide, since that time, over the course of the first quarter of this fiscal year, we have rebounded a little bit, and we're now currently trending at 35% down. So that equates overall to projected revenue loss of $672,000 in the transient guest tax fund. So specifically how that relates to the overall budget, the original adopted budget for tourism revenue going into the fiscal year assumed that we would be uh, collecting about $1.9 million. Uh, that's very consistent with what we've had in previous fiscal years. Uh, we were on track to do that uh, last fiscal year, actually exceed it prior to COVID hitting. So we were pretty comfortable projecting that as a revenue target for this upcoming fiscal year before we actually started analyzing some of the trends. So now the COVID impacted revenue projection minus that $672,000 representing the 35% loss, uh, we are projecting about 1.23 million uh, total in transient guest tax revenue this year. So in order to start compensating for that projected shortfall, uh, staff has identified a few things that we might uh, be able to do, some actions that we could take to start making that up. So in total so far, what we're proposing here is about $548,000 in reduced tourism expenses. 
Uh, the things that are on this slide uh, make up some of those actions that are included in that $548,000. Uh, the very first bullet point there actually was something that we did at the at the end of last fiscal year uh, to help cover some of the operations at the recreation centers as they were reopening. Um, the, the National Frontier Trails Museum was closed at the time and we had a staff member there that was assigned to that location. Uh, when we reopened the recreation centers, a lot of our center attendants did not return uh, for various different reasons. Uh, so we were a bit short on coverage there. And that particular person was transferred over just to shore up operations. Uh, she remains there today. Uh, that condition with our center attendants still exists. Uh, we do have uh, shortages of staff uh, throughout the department actually, especially at the part-time level. And this person is continuing uh, to work in that, um, in that vein and helping us at all of our different recreation centers. Uh, this proposal calls for going ahead and transferring that position full-time for this, the remainder of this fiscal year. Uh, the other type of things that we're doing is we are eliminating the bus rentals for our familiarization tours. Obviously, we're not bringing in a whole lot of folks at this point to, uh, to tour around. Uh, so that was in a low-hanging fruit cut. Uh, reducing overnight travel and meetings, events and meetings for the same type of situation. Uh, we cut our experiential history tours uh, for not just this first part of the fiscal year, but for the remaining part of the fiscal year. Uh, we were spending about $83,000 a year on that particular program, so we are proposing that we forego that for this fiscal year. Uh, we're also reducing sponsorships and incentives and obviously trade show attendance. Uh, some of those sponsorships, for example, the uh, Kansas City Royals, we canceled that sponsorship. Uh, it was a pretty expensive sponsorship deal and it just didn't make a whole lot of sense to sponsor with the type of collateral and deliverables that we were receiving because it was really heavily dependent on eyes on at the ballpark and of course with no attendance that didn't make a whole lot of sense so we were able to uh, we were able to drop that contract for this year a few of the other more notable actions and these actually these two make up the bulk of those savings uh, we're going to propose that we continue to close the nftm through june 30 of 2021 um, oh. that uh, yeah that's uh, that that's significant. Uh, it's also a significant savings at this point. I also want to point out that we were fortunate and unfortunate, uh, depending on your, on your point of view. We had several vacancies at the museum prior to COVID. We were getting ready to actually conduct some interviews and start looking to fill those positions when COVID hit. So when it did, we decided, you know, we're going to put a hold on that. We're not going to obviously fill those positions. Let's see what happens. So we rolled into COVID and still at this point uh, with three vacancies within the National Frontier Trails Museum. So, so this proposal that you're looking at does not cut any positions. It simply holds vacant positions vacant for the rest of the fiscal year. Uh, the second thing that we were looking to do is cover the costs associated with the historic sites, grounds and facility maintenance with parks and recreation sales tax funds. So, so a couple of points I want to make here. Uh, first, the work that's being performed in that particular cost center is consistent with what Parks and Recreation does. It's mowing, it's landscaping, it's small fix-its around the, around the uh, facilities. It also should be noted that the staff that is actually doing that uh, are housed out of the parks facility and they are managed by parks supervisors. So they are part of our parks team, they are simply assigned to the historic sites and presently are being compensated, they're being paid from the transient gas tax. This proposal calls for transferring the cost of those services over to park sales tax for just one fiscal year, for this fiscal year, uh, and, and then transferring it back uh, next fiscal year, depending on how all the finances are working out with the transient gas tax. So I by- if, if we can do that legally. Yeah, I, I personally, I believe so. Lawyer. Sorry, is that going to be? Ask the law department to take a look at it. You're talking sure. about using park and recreational sales tax funds, which were a restricted kind of account to be used only for what the voters approved, and we're using it in a different manner. I really, really want the lawyer to look at that. 
Yeah, we'll we'll certainly vet that through, and and I, I have a little bit more information here in the in the presentation that might might shed a little bit of light on on that expenditure. Uh, but I will note have to note that that the a, at least for a couple of the facilities, the Bingham Wagner in particular, that property was purchased with land and water conservation funds. So technically, uh, by by federal regulation and um, and covenants and restrictions placed on that property through that sale, that is pro that is a public park. Um, so 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 I think the argument can certainly be made. Uh, but we will, uh, yes, Councilmember Lucy, we will certainly run that through our uh, our legal department just for clarification. Yeah. So with with those uh, with those actions, um, including the transfer of funds, which is out of the uh, transient guest tax over the park sales tax, we are still projecting for the end of this fiscal year the the parks and recreation sales tax fund balance uh, to be about one point seven million dollars. So so we do have some money in the bank, which is good. Um, uh, so, and we sorry, I, I got to interrupt you again, Eric. If we've got almost $2 million in the bank, why are we even looking at using park and recreation sales tax funds to pay tourism things? The, the, the 1.7 million is parks and recreation sales tax funds. The transient guest tax funds, we're projecting those. If we continue with this proposal, uh, we are projecting somewhere around eight hundred and twenty thousand dollars in reserves, uh, which is which is not a lot because of the uh, of that's all the funding that tourism has. Um, so it's it's uh, it, it's not a lot to have in the bank to go forward in another fiscal year when we don't know what the pandemic exactly is going to do, and more importantly, how long it's going to take for the transient guest tax to rebound. Uh, so so we thought. From Christy, from from her right in that grant, um, can that be used for anything other than ads for future visitors? No, unfortunately, can't. So, so that one point, little more million dollars, uh, that was very specific, very restricted, and it was not meant to supplant any of our existing budget. It was for marketing efforts on top and in addition to what we already had planned and was on the books. It also had to be very specific related to COVID. So uh, so the, the ads had to have masks on and promote that type of, of scenario. So, so as, as, as thrilled as we were to get that, it was pretty specific. All right. Okay. All right, there are a few other operational adjustments that I thought I should note here as well. Um, again, mostly these are operations. They do save a little bit of money, uh, but a lot of these were uh, were done as much because of the shortage of volunteers that we're experiencing and projecting to experience uh, as, as it was uh, with the budget condition. So the historic sites still are scheduled to reopen in the spring of 2021. Uh, however, we did a pretty heavy trend analysis on the last three years of visitors to figure out if there was any opportunity to um, to reduce operations at all. And what we found was that by far most of the visitors were coming Friday through Monday. Uh, so our proposal is to open the Big and Wagner, CNA Depot, Vail Mansion uh, Friday through Monday. Uh, that's not to say that drop in tours if we have someone coming in town with a group uh, can't be scheduled. Uh, we'll have information out there on how they can do that. And then our full-time staff will go and, and open the facilities and conduct those tours uh, ourselves. So, so that relieves some of the pressures that we were experiencing from the shortage of volunteers. Uh, we were aging out in the volunteer workforce for these historic sites uh, as it was. Uh, we were slow in replacing those with other volunteers. And then when COVID hit, uh, that number of active volunteers that were willing to come in and cover these hours uh, decreased even more. So, so at least uh, for next fiscal year, for this spring and going into next fiscal year, uh, this is the schedule that we'll be proposing. And again, uh, this accommodates 85% of all the visitors that were showing up anyway, uh, and then others can be accommodated on um, a special call-in basis. Uh, the Long Courthouse, which was kind of hit and miss anyway, will be open by appointment only, similar to what we're doing uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at the other sites. Uh, the Truman Depot uh, will still remain closed. That actually is more a product of the project uh, more than anything. So, 
so the we are hoping that we will finally get to a point where we can do a groundbreaking here this spring uh, and then construction over the summer and we can open that facility again uh, over the uh, course of the next fall. Um, and then obviously that will be a, another tourism attraction once that's completed. Visitor Center, we decided to go ahead and keep that open Monday through Saturday as we presently do. Uh, the, uh, the visitor numbers seem to justify that. Okay. So this, um, this proposal has been vetted out through the diff various different commissions uh, that we staff. Tourism Com Commission endorsed the plan on October 27, 2020. Uh, the Park Commission endorsed the plan conditionally on November 5th. Uh, they added an amendment to the proposal, uh, essentially saying that once the transient guest tax revenue returned to normal, pre-COVID rates of return, uh, then, um, then we would reimburse the Parks and Recreation sales tax back uh, for what was spent out of the transient guest tax. Okay, so uh, so really next slide, please. So basically this plan provides, uh, we feel for a strategic, places us in a position for a strategic reopening of the historic sites. It optimizes resources, uh, provides for cost reduction savings in order to basically make the tourism fund financially stable through the pandemic scenario. Um, and, and it also keeps us in a position to quickly gear up when we get through this pandemic, because this too shall pass. We're going to make it through this. And when we do, we want to make sure that the Parks, Recreation and Tourism Department is, is amply staffed and ready to go uh, because our gut tells us, uh, the National Parks and Recreation Association tells us and others, that the pent up demand for parks, recreation services, as well as uh, for travel and such, is, is so great that once it's opened back up, uh, we are going to see a great influx and great need and demand. And we wanna make sure that we are geared up and ready to go to flip the switch back on quickly, fully. Uh, so with that said, we're, we're hoping to have a discussion here and to get some kind of endorsement or not for the, uh, for the plan, and, and then we'll go from there. I mean, well, well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my first question is, is money the only reason you're suggesting a, a, a cut in the tourism hours? Is it money? Well, it's, it's really at the different sites right now, it's twofold. It's, it's financial. There is some salary, there's some savings associated with that. Um, but it's also just a mere staffing uh, scenario. Again, the volunteers, uh, the number of volunteers have really fallen off. They were dwindling at, at pre COVID. Then once COVID hit, uh, folks just aren't com comfortable coming back at this point. So, uh, I don't know that we would be able to staff it. As a matter of fact, we looked at the numbers. We wouldn't be able to staff it fully if we were open uh, traditionally. So, so the, the schedule that we are offering up here ensures that we can staff it fully, we can have it ready for walk-in tours on those days, and then again by appointment on the opposite days. But like, I have friends that, that, that run the Bingham Wagner and the Chicago Alton and the Vale, and there's a lot of volunteers. I mean, it's not like we have city staff there every day. Do we? And I just didn't know that. Uh, we had actually over the course of the last few years, we had started to put money in the budget for site attendance because there were so many holes in the coverage hours for the various historic sites. Uh, so, so yeah, there's still a good number of them, but yet not enough to be able to staff fully uh, all of those different hours. You have some volunteers that have picked up a lot of extra shifts uh, that, um, uh, to, in order to just keep things covered. And we've heard from them that they're just not willing, not able uh, perhaps to, uh, to sustain that. So they needed our help. Have they looked at this? Have the historic yeah. sites looked at this? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the hours. Oh yes, absolutely. Christy, maybe you could uh, tap in and, and talk about the discussions you've had with, uh, with the societies on, on the various different hours here. Right, I know that um, Frank Burrow, who is our uh, historic site and uh, the museum manager, um, talked to the friends groups um, when we were even discussing this um, before we were talking about going back. 
initially in July. And that was the schedule that they were given when we all thought we were going back in July. And so it vetted through all of the friends groups and approved by them. So you're saying the Bingham Wagner group yes. looked at this and said, we're okay with this. And so did yeah. Chicago Walton and so did the Vale. Vale, yes. Wow. Wow. Because they were all struggling to find volunteers to fill just even the weekend positions. I'm going to encourage the city manager to take a look at all those amendments I made way back in June or July. Uh, I identified over $300,000 in meetings, overnight travel, memberships that I believe the city could cut. And that 300,000 would go a long way towards saving what I consider to be our jewel, which is our tourism. And once you close a tourist site, good luck getting the, the people back. I mean, this is a long-term consequence to just closing something for six months. Let's say we get a vaccine and we, you know, a miracle happens and by golly, here it is June 1 or here it is April 1 and people are moving again. Well, we've made a decision at council to close something until July. Well, that you decision. I, mean? I just think that's, I think this is drastic. That's all. Well, I, I guess we'll see in January if it's, if it's drastic or if it's not drastic enough, honestly. We're, we're going to take another hard look at the numbers as we get them through December. So that'll give us six months worth of revenue data to analyze. And then we'll look at this plan again to see if we need to adjust one way or the other. Hopefully, transit and guest taxes has started to rebound. And if it does, then we can certainly change things up and, uh, and begin operating in a, in a vein to reopen the museum uh, as soon as we can. That's going to take, obviously, filling those positions. And, and that would be the first thing that we would look at doing uh, in order to get things back up and running. Because the major fundraisers for these tourist sites are the spring, guys. I mean, and we're talking about no strawberry festival, no um, craft fair. I mean, Christmas is gone. It's shot. Yep. And that's a big deal for these, these sites. They made a lot of money at Christmas. When do you need an answer on this? Um, well, we will, be, um, we will be looking again in January uh, at this for sure. The, the Trails Museum was scheduled to stay closed through... December 31st, anyways, part of the original budget that we uh, that we put forward to you. Uh, so, so honestly, we're going to come back in January and and we can have the discussion again uh, with this group and we'll see where we're at. Uh, we just know that that we're going to be short of transient guest tax money. The degree to which uh, we still are not sure. Uh, it, it's it's a positive trend. We went from 57 percent down in the last quarter of last fiscal year to 35% down today. So, so that's a pretty good improvement. If it continues, then, then we might be relatively okay. We're still gonna be short some. Uh, we're not gonna make it all up, but we might be in a little bit better position. Um, but at this point, the only thing we have going on is the current trend that we've been looking at, and that puts us at close to $700,000 down out of a two million budget. If I can jump in, so, <laughs> I'm assuming, Eric, this is going to be fluid, kind of like everything else is. If we decide to, to do the shutdown, then months down the road, we see that vaccine, the vaccine has, has been successful. The economy is, is ramping up and tourism is beginning to see an uptick. I mean, we can always revisit this and come back and reopen or having a slow roll open, a better phraseology. Um, and I know you're, you're in tune with what's going on nationally. We're not the only ones that have, have slowed down or probably shuttered some sites for sure. So there's not a lot, I don't think we're missing out on a lot compared to other historic sites or, or am I misreading some of that? No, I think you're, you're spot on, on there. Uh, Christy has done a little bit more in-depth research uh, on some of the museum operations and I think she has found exactly that. So Christy, I don't know if you wanna add, add to that a little bit. Uh, when we did research, uh, most of the uh, 
the privately owned uh, museums, et cetera, were closed during this time. Um, I know with the new restrictions that have come out, I'm thinking that's going to affect them. You know, the ones, the few that were open, I would think that they probably will be changing um, their availability as far as attendance. And I think that um, the, the travel season, you know, usually slows down for the holidays anyway. Um, but, you know, everybody's down across the board, across the state, across the country. So we are definitely not alone here. So yeah, thank you. Go ahead. And, and actually, we we get uh, what's called the STAR reports, STR reports, and and that basically shows us what the occupancy rates and trends are across the state. And we are uh, we are actually doing much better than some, a little better than others. So we are at the mid to top area as far as loss is concerned. Uh, some of the other areas of the of the state are suffering even more than we are at this point. So I would I would say mine is trying to fix our budget short short falls right now is to try to position ourselves for when the economy starts rolling and people get get back out whenever that may be probably 12 months from now. Um, and trying to capture as much COVID relief fund that we can for marketing sounds like that's very strategic. Is there any way that we can, I'm sure you're looking at how we can dovetail with say the Truman Library to really double our marketing efforts or or how we do our strategies with rolling out as things get going that we're here, we're open for business and how we can position ourselves to to get, get us geared up for that? Yes, we uh, most definitely are. Uh, we're in partnership with well, with all of our tourism sites, but the library, especially with their expansion quite a bit, we focused even some of the tourism ads uh, that was paid for through the yeah, the state COVID CARES funding, uh, specifically geared on on the, the library with their assistance. One of the, one of the podcasts, uh, Rob Lowe actually was reading, specifically talked about the, uh, the library, which is a pretty cool thing. That's what money can do for you, I guess. Uh, but the uh, uh, but Christy and her team and Mad Media are continuing to look at different COVID relief funding opportunities. Uh, they come in occasionally. Sometimes we qualify. Sometimes we don't. So uh, we're doing everything we can to bring in every dime. Eric, well, I was going to say that we, we also have um, this last couple of weeks have been working with uh, the genealogy library about doing some co-opting for marketing and, and trying to you know leverage that strategically so you know we can do that collaboratively and not you know just our budget or just their budget we can you know maximize our dollar so those uh conversations have happened in the last couple of weeks as well sure it's going to be a weird weird thing those those cities that are ready and and ability to have it open and enforce have the foresight to get it going those are the ones that's going to recoup the, the benefits the passes for sure so the, Eric, Christy, thanks for your hard work getting this rolling. And I appreciate it, guys. But talking about marketing when everything's closed is sort of ridiculous, isn't it? No well, offense. It, well, it, it puts you on the map. Closed. Well, it, it keeps you on the map, keeps you as part of the conversation, keeps keeps the, the stuff that we have in front of them. And quite frankly, it, it is, yeah, we're marketing today, but people are planning for tomorrow. So that's the folks that we're trying to hit. It's exactly I would what say that before we started all this marketing that we did with the the state cares act money um, we were maybe getting 25 to 30 visitor guide requests uh, a month in this last month um, after we really started doing that marketing and advertising it was closer to 200 so people are tr um, planning their travel they're starting to think you know three months six months out and so that means that they're including us in those uh in that plan so you know that's really why you know we did the marketing that we did for future travelers so when things I'm not, I'm not critical of the marketing what i'm critical about is shutting it down for seven or eight months that i'm not critical at all of marketing i think it's wonderful but i just don't know that i want to sit here in november to say we're closed until july 1. well the 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 other sites are opening all the sites except for the national furniture trails museum would be open on april April 1st or the 1st of April or so, just like they traditionally would. So, so that's still all rolling. So really what we're only talking about is the National Frontier Trails Museum. 
So they would be open on this limited schedule. Yes, that is correct. So they would not be open on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. But right. they would be open Friday right. through Monday. Yeah, and that is, according to the trend analysis that we did, that is when most of the visitors are coming. And I know the city manager is having trouble with his computer and his phone and all that stuff, but. Hey, I mean, I'm back, baby. Hey, you're back. All right. <laughs> I'll remember Listen, I don't know when council's going to get this, but at the same time we get this, I really would like um, to have an in-depth look at the, you know, the $330,000 I was talking about trying to, to cut from the budget in the amendments yeah. of, of this past year, because I can't mm -hmm. imagine tourism is a jewel. And, it is. and I mean, I don't want to leave money in a membership account knowing we're not going to use that money when Mr. Erfer here is trying to, to, to keep afloat his department. It's just crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So good point. I, what I really like first and foremost about his plan and, and that Christy worked on uh, as well very hard is they're, they're putting a premium on preserving staff, which certainly has the humane aspect, but there's the strategic part too that we want to be able to hit the ground running when um, life resumes and, and more and more with the news we're hearing about this vaccine, it looks like that will be, you know, sooner rather than later, not as soon as we want, of course, but sooner rather than later. And we're going to be well positioned by having staff in place to just resume operations as was the case. Um, I like your thoughts of, you know, making sure we're nimble with those reserves and resources that we had. The reason I wanted Eric and his team to bring us here today is the pandemic has really hit hardest in two places, the tourism fund being one, the um, stay well uh, health insurance fund being the other. We're taking a little bit of a longer term look at that one, probably have some suggestions for this committee and the council, the early part of 2021 there. But yeah, your suggestions are well um, taken, Councilwoman, that we will um, you know, begin to implement, you know, certain aspects of this, but, you know, not just keep the lock on the door being penny wise and pound foolish. If, if folks are indicating they're ready to start resuming leisure tourism activities again, we'll pull whatever resources necessary to get those doors back open to them. Mr. Hobart, anything? No, all I would say is I have I appreciate the conservative approach, Mr. Erfer. Uh, obviously, I don't want the our tourist sites to be shut down longer than they need to, but uh, I'm always in favor of bearing on the side of uh, safety and health over um, what impatience or expediency. That's all. Anything else, Mr. Perkins? Nothing for me. Mr. Roper, what do you need from us? Uh, well, um, eyes and ears. So so obviously this is being streamed. So if you hear feedback that we're not hearing, it would be uh, greatly appreciated if you'd send that to our, our attention um, yeah. for sure. And um, and then just be prepared to have another conversation in, in January. Uh, so once we get the six month numbers in, we'll, we'll take another look. Oh, Mr. Erfer, you and I are going to talk long before January about this. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chairwoman, can I? Uh, yes, sir. Like we were doing with IPL, I don't think we need a quarterly report, but maybe a uh, maybe a memo of of where we're at on some of these numbers, just Excellent just so suggestion. we can keep it up on on the burner somewhat. Excellent suggestion, Mr. Perkins. How about it, Mr. Erfer? Absolutely. Yeah, we'll work that through Zach's office, and we'll make sure you guys get that. Okay. Thanks, Thank Eric. You. Thanks, everybody. Two hours into our meeting, people, and I am so sorry it's gone so long. I have a lot of questions up about the operating report, um, but it's I'm tired. Everybody's tired. What do you want to do? We can hold over. Um, adjourn it. Do you want to uh, reschedule for uh, Thanksgiving ne next week? Um, how about we don't have a meeting Monday? Can can we finish up Monday, guys? You know, this coming Monday, sure. or, or the thirtieth. This Monday, I'm out. I'm it, I'm working a ton of overtime this week because it's okay. well, day of sure. Monday. 
Okay. I forgot. But yeah. I'm I'm still pretty pretty free on that thirtieth. Thank you guys. <sighs> book. Okay, let's go ahead and set an appointment for the 30th. Council member, okay, this right. is Adam. Council member, hmm. this is Adam Norris. Oh, hi, Adam. Hey there. Uh, just, just a thought. Uh, I don't know if the entire committee has questions about the operating report, but we'd, we'd be glad to meet with you uh, individually if that's easier to get your questions addressed in a more timely manner. Oh, I think it should be with the committee though, Adam. I do appreciate your okay. thought, but okay. we made a decision that we were going to have a monthly review, so I'd like to continue with that. And we could do the 30th. How about the 30th at like, I don't know, three o'clock, two o'clock, something like that? Either way, two o'clock's fine. That works with you, Dan? Mr. Hobart? Oh. Yes. Yes, that's fine. Okay, so uh, Mr. Toma Perry, are you still on the phone? Is two o'clock on the thirtieth okay with you? Yes, it is. Mr. Kidney, how about you? Uh, I'll I'll need to have a staff member cover for me, but they're the ones that produce the financials, so they should be able to have the answers. Okay. I don't think there's anybody else. I guess. Is there anybody else I should ask? Mr. Walker, I guess. <laughs> Zach, you're coming to a meeting. November 30th at 2 p.m. We're going to have a Zoom meeting again, I assume. Because numbers uh, are really high. Wonderful. Okay, that, that's perfect. Miss Becky, can you set that up for us? Yeah, I'll get everything taken care of as far as the agenda goes. And just so I understand that agenda is specifically for the financial and operating report. That's all you'll be covering? It's number six on the agenda. It's the October monthly financial and then the specific line item. It's item number six. We just didn't get there. Yeah. And are you guys wanting to go over number seven, which is establishing your next meeting date? As I'd well. Like to that. I would is December 18 at 2 30 okay, guys? Yeah. Say that. Okay. And then I would like, um, okay, yeah. So then the, the 30th of November is simply item number six. And then December 18 will be the update on debt, debt service and quarterly review of IPL. Anybody else have anything else they want to add to the December 18th? I don't. Mr. Hobart, do you have anything you want to add? No. Okay. Everybody, thank you for your patience, and we'll talk to you later. Oh, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Motion. Seconded. We're done.